So the title of my message this morning is Only One Thing is Needed. And I want to read from Psalms chapter 27, verse 4. <clears throat> One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. And then from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all of the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. <clears throat> So our focus this morning is going to be on worship and in some ways it's easier to talk about what worship is not than what worship is. So worship is not singing, it's not preaching, it's not reciting liturgy. However, it can, all of those things can be included in worship. But worship itself is not those things. It doesn't have to occur in a church. In fact, it can and should occur anywhere and any time. Worship is about God. And worship is about glorifying God and developing our relationship to him and drawing closer to him through that relationship. Now, sometimes we allow ourselves to get our eyes off of what really matters. We take our eyes off of God and we put them on something else. And sometimes it's that, that is something in the church. And I didn't initially have this analogy, but I'm gonna use this as an analogy now. I'm the one who typed America the Beautiful <laughs> on the screen and put they instead of thy, and sh shining instead of shining. So <laughs> if that is something that you're sitting here now going, ah, I can't believe it. I can't believe that was on the screen. Um, just know that, you know, that's not an easy job. And sometimes you, when, you're, when you're proofreading, you, you miss that. So that, I'm going to use that as one of my analogies. But an another analogy that I'd like to use is when I was um, growing up, I went to a, a little church in Bowlesburg. And the church was talking about redoing the sanctuary. And in the middle of the sanctuary was a huge chandelier, old, antique, some said it was beautiful, some said it was ugly. Um, you know, nobody ever kind of thinks the same. But anyhow, the church council got together and they, in redoing the church, they decided that they wanted to get rid of this chandelier. Well, that, can, that caused huge problems in the church. And some people left the church because we got rid of the chandelier. Now, um, is that, is that a misplaced allegiance? Um, I think so. You know, and, and it was not to, not to slight how they felt about that, that part of the sanctuary, but really um, it, it was insignificant when we're thinking about worship and worshiping God and, and putting our attention on him. Um, another example that I have is uh, when, when Bob and I first um, got married. We were attending a church and, and one of the life elders of the church 
made a comment to me that I have remembered for a long, long time that, that really took me back. And he said, he said, you know, pastors, pastors come and go, um, but I'm going to be at this church forever. Even if Satan himself is in the pulpit, I will continue to come to this church. And I'm like, whoa, really? I mean, he thought so much, this is my church, and this is what, if this, this, this is how strongly I feel about my church. Um, that is just not, not, a good, not a good focus to have. You know, this is God's house. You know, if this, if, if this building would disappear tomorrow, we worship in the temple. Our, the, our, our heart is the temple of the Holy Spirit. When we come together, we come together and worship, not because it's this place, but because we all have Christ in our hearts. So music, or so worship, is very important. And music—that's another—that's another thing that causes tension and problems in, in in church. Worship is very, very important. And this morning, what I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at some characters in the Bible that we all know: um, David, Paul, the Apostle Paul, and also Mary and her sister Martha. And look at how this whole um, only one thing being needed applies to them. So David, who was David? Well, we're, we, most of us are, are familiar with David. We're probably all familiar with David. David was a truly remarkable man. <clears throat> he was a great leader for the nation of Israel. He was a, a great soldier. He was a, a musician. He was a psalmist. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, it says that he was a man after God's own heart. You know, this David, who he was really a, a man, might have been viewed as a man of man, a man of men. And what does he say in Psalm 27, verse 4? He says, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. Because David, because he desired this one thing, he knew that all things would come together, that all things would fall into place. For David, his relationship with God was the one thing that mattered the most. David knew that seeking God and dwelling in the Lord's presence was the main spring for everything that would happen in his life. That one thing would set everything into motion. That part enabled all of the things to function as they were intended. So he knew, he knew that this was the most important thing and he demonstrated that in his life. Have you ever looked back and thought, you know, that's why that thing happened to me in my life. That's what God was preparing me for. You know, I think we, we all have had that experience. David knew that if the one thing needed was fulfilled, that one thing that he desired and sought, he knew that everything else was going to fall into place. Now, I used to say sometimes I felt like, I felt like, um, like a lamb or, or some, some sort of a, a puppy or something that was being guided through my life. I just kind of felt like God had, had ordered it. And that's what he does. He does order our, our lives. But we need to be in relationship with him and give him control. And in addition to looking and seeking and desiring God, David had an enthusiasm and a passion 
and he longed to know God. It wasn't a momentary thing. It wasn't something that he did once a week and kind of devoted his, his time to God in an hour on Sunday, but it was a lifelong thing. It was a thread through his entire life. And it was an intimate, consuming desire of his heart that dominated all that he did. And God was faithful and took David through lots and lots of things. The only thing that David needed was to know God, to behold the beauty and the ple pleasantness of the Lord. Everything else was incidental. The fact that he was a great leader, the fact that he was a great king, that he was a great preacher, a musician, a psalmist, all of those things were incidental. Only one thing really mattered. And that was his intimate fellowship that he had with God. To be a true worshiper of God, that passion needs to be there. David says, that will I seek after. Because this was the primary thing he knew it was essential to all that he had or would achieve in his life. It was the primary thing. So this is true for you and me too. You know, our relationship with God has to be the primary thing in our lives. It has to take that number one spot. And at the end of the day, each of us need to ask, you know, what did I do today? Or how much time did I spend today for that one thing? That is the most important. So David knew what the one thing was. And then we have the Apostle Paul. What was Paul's passion? Paul was passionate about Christ too. In Philippians 3.10, Paul says, That I may know him. Paul knew Jesus as Lord and Savior. But he wanted more. He wanted more. He wanted to know God intimately. He wanted to know Jesus more and more. It was the primary thing in Paul's life. How about you and me? Have we put Jesus in that place of being the primary person? Knowing him is that primary for us. And in Philippians 3.8, Paul says, For Christ I have suffered the loss of all things, that I may gain Christ. It was important to him. Christ was his goal. Knowing Christ was his goal. To win Christ, to know Christ, to love Christ, to have an intimate fellowship with Jesus Christ. Jesus was the center of Paul's life and Jesus was his passion. And when Paul was doing things for the Lord, it wasn't a duty, it wasn't drudgery, and it wasn't a chore, but it was a delight because Jesus was at the center. That's true for us too. You know, have you ever kind of felt like you were just doing, doing, doing? You know, if, it's, if Christ is not at the center of what we do for him at church or in our life, it becomes a chore. It becomes hard, menial, dull work because we've lost the focus. We've lost the center. And so that's really important as we go out and we're working for, for the Lord or doing things for the Lord. Um, <clears throat> if you think about, and this dates me, if you think about an LP, you know, a, a record, and uh, the, the center point of it, you know, if it's right in the center, it plays really well. 
But I don't know if you've ever gotten one that the, the center point was a little bit off, and so it kind of was like, that you can tell that it's not where it needs to be. If, if we don't keep Christ in the center, things kind of go off kilter a little bit. The next person I want to look at is Mary. And this is a very familiar story, the story of Mary and Martha. Um, <clears throat> Mary, a lot of people will identify with one of these two women. Most women that I've talked with will identify usually with Martha. I know I'm Martha. The kitchen is my place. The home is my place. Looking after my family. That's what I do. I'm Martha. Well, you know, we think of Martha as being this busy, busy, busy woman. But you know what? Mary was also busy. But Mary was busy concentrating on a different form of service. And after looking at this and after reading the things I was reading in preparation for this sermon, I kind of, I kind of looked a little differently at Martha than I had before. <clears throat> in this story, the Lord comes into the house and Martha, the action person, Martha welcomes him. And Mary sits at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Now imagine this. Martha is rushing around trying to accomplish everything, trying to make sure everything is just right. And Mary is sitting. Does that give anyone anxiety? That makes me a little anxious when I, when I think about that story. So Martha, you know, she's, and she's not happy about it. She's not happy that she's doing all the work. And she has a bit of an attitude when she talks to Jesus. So she says to Jesus, Lord, don't you care? You come into the house. You see what is happening. You see I'm doing all the work. And you don't care. Mary isn't doing anything. Martha's interaction with Jesus tells us something about her. She has a complaining spirit. A complaining spirit. And in other words, she is consumed with self-pity. Now I have to think, you know, if she complained to the Lord and rebuked him... I wonder what she would do to the other people in the house. It probably wasn't pretty. <clears throat> so she gives Jesus a command. Tell her to help me. Don't you care? Okay, really? Martha? Martha's giving Jesus a command? And Jesus could have said... Now, Martha, I know that you're busy, and it's just too bad that Mary isn't helping you. But Jesus ignores her. He is not going to feed the monster self in Martha. And he's not going to feed the monster self in us either. When we get away, when we pull away from, from, from God, if we don't keep that close relationship with the Lord, we'll fall into that whole self-pity, complaining spirit thing. So she was, she was full of self-pity. So what does Jesus say? He says, Martha, Martha. You are worried and bothered about so many things. Many things had consumed Martha. They'd come into her life and they had bothered her and troubled her. And don't those things come into our lives and bother us and trouble us and take us off course. Things can smother us. Things can sidetrack us. So we need to be content in him, not in things. 
Jesus says, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken from her. So how are Mary and Martha different? I think we can see how they're different. You know, is Mary that irritable woman of action who works with her hands and Mary's the quiet, introspective woman that meditates? Scripture doesn't really describe them that way. So how does Scripture look at these two women? Well, there is a time in Mary's life when she made a choice and Martha did not. Mary had chosen, and that is always the difference between a person who is satisfied with Christ and a person who is dissatisfied with life. One made the choice. The other had not. We choose to be Martha. God wants us to be Mary. Now consider this quote. This really hit me. Consider this quote from Joseph Carroll's book, How to Worship Jesus Christ. You never drift into being Mary. You can always drift into being Martha. All you have to do is just let yourself go. No woman ever drifted into being a Mary. No woman ever drifted into being a Mary. Because it takes work to be a Mary. It takes devotion. It takes love. It takes time. It takes, it takes quiet time with the Lord to be Mary. No woman drifts to be Mary. And I added... No man, because I felt like men were, men were left out here, so I don't want to leave you men out. No man ever drifted into being a David or a Paul. You don't drift into that. And no person ever drifted into being like Jesus. We don't drift into being like Jesus. It takes time, devotion, quiet time, reading our Bibles, getting to know the Lord, spending time with Him in prayer, all of those things. So worship, we were created to worship God. That's why we were created. Now we all worship something, but we were created to worship Jesus Christ, to seek Him in his temple, to gaze on his beauty, to dwell in his presence, and to know him intimately, to be seated in him. Consistent, heartfelt worship requires discipline. You know, we need to reject what we want and seek out what God wants for us. It demands that we turn away from that sinful nature that we have and repent and change the way that we're living. It demands that we take the things out of our lives that give us trouble. Those things that will pull us away and will not be contributing to the one thing needed. So there are six things that I want to just briefly read. Uh, uh, um, I have them written in my Bible that are hindrances to worship. The first one, an unsurrendered heart. There is no such thing as a once-for-all surrender. For didn't our Lord say, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. We need to dethrone ourselves and enthrone Christ. Number two, unconfessed sin. Confess sin immediately, calling it by its worst name. Repent and go on with your Lord. 
Number three, a wrong attitude. A wrong attitude grieves the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4 um, says, Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow, grief, to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Wrong attitude, especially toward our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. That interferes with our ability to worship. Enemy opposition, number four. There may be times when the, when the oppressive cloud will come to distract you. Refuse it in the name of Jesus. Do not be deceived into thinking a sudden heaviness of spirit is because of some undealt sin. It is invariably the enemy. Number five is physical tiredness. Get sufficient sleep, consistent exercise. Guard against emotional fatigue, for this will cause a more debilitating tiredness than most any other factor. And number six, unbelief. When you prepare yourself for worship, faith is foremost. You must believe that you are going to have a wonderful time with the Lord and in his presence. All of those things can come between us and our God. Let's get rid of them. Let's not allow those things to hinder us. As a closing, I would like to, uh, to um, kind of summarize a, a story in here about a, a soldier, because I thought it was appropriate for Memorial Day. And this soldier's name was Tom Walton. And he he served um, in like 1939, around the time of World War II. It says, the writer of this says, I was present the night Tom was converted in an army army training camp hut. The chaplain preached a powerful gospel message, and following his appeal, there was the thud, thud, thud of the hobnail boots of a young man coming to the front. I looked up and saw a rosy-cheeked fellow with big horn-rimmed glasses making his way forward to surrender all to Christ as Lord. Tom was won the hearts of his older comrades when he laid his life on the line and was decorated for bravery in his very first engagement with his unit. The men in Tom Walton's battalion didn't call him Tom. They respectfully called him Christian. Why did they call him Christian? What made Tom so different that the whole battalion knew of him? and respected him highly? The answer is simple. Our young soldier of Jesus Christ had made the worship of of his Lord the first thing in his life. I read his diary after the war. It was not unusual to find statements such as, we attack at dawn, I will be up at four o'clock to worship my Lord. One morning he was absent from parade when his name was called, and the officer said to the sergeant, Where's Walton? He answered, I do not know, sir. Finding Tom, the sergeant said, Walton, Walton, we're on parade, get on parade. What is the matter, man? So Tom very quickly put on his equipment and made his way to the parade ground. Three or four days later, the same thing happened again. Where is Walton, Sergeant? I do not know. Well, go and find him. So the Sergeant went to Tom's tent, and there was Tom on his knees praying. 
The officer said, if this happens again, Walton, I will have to, par I will have to parade you before the colonel. It did happen again, and this time he was taken up before the colonel who, of course, had decorated the boy and knew him. Three times you have been absent from parade, said the colonel. This is not a good example for a corporal Christian. This is not like you. What's wrong? Tom, in his beautiful, sweet way, said, Well, colonel, I begin to worship my Lord Jesus. He used to call him his beautiful Lord Jesus. And I cannot hear anything. I do not hear the bugle. I do not hear the men. I do not hear anything. I'm sorry. Tom had reached that rare plateau of lostness in the worship of his Lord. The rattle of equipment, the shrill peal of the bugle, the noise of running feet, he was oblivious to it all. At 19 years of age, Tom Walton was in action in Borneo when suddenly he was not, for God took him. Pray with me. Father, we know that we've been created to worship. Lord, you have created us that we might come into your presence. Lord, help us to know you more, to love you more. Help us to make you the only thing needed, that one thing needed in our lives. And we trust that when we put you first, that you'll bring order to all the rest of, of the things that we experience day after day. Lord, help us. Help us to focus on you. Don't allow us to be hindered by the things that we put before you but to cast them off and focus on you and put you in the center. Lord, we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.